good afternoon and welcome to the Oaks Church. I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet. My name is Terry Lee. I'm one of the pastors at the Oaks. If you have a copy of God's Word, go ahead and find Colossians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be finishing up the first chapter of Colossians this morning, and then we're going to go into a little bit of the second chapter together. So go ahead and meet me there. Um, I want to give you a quick update just on where we're at with the building. I know that many of you already know that a few weeks ago, uh, we voted at an 88% majority as a church family to move forward on making an offer on the property that is on Oaklawn Drive. Uh, I want to just remind you that we feel that a building doesn't somehow uh, make us legitimate. A building isn't something that's just kind of like, oh, if we just get this thing, then all of our problems will be solved. We see this as a tool to bring restoration through the gospel. Um, even this week, we had a missional community group leader training, and uh, we had it at my home in my living room, and we packed out our living room. And so if we're going to continue to train more leaders and do more things like that, we're going to need more space. Um, yesterday, we gathered people together to assemble bags with the Gospel of Mark in them and gift bags to give out to our city. And if we're going to continue to do things like that, we kind of need a base camp, a headquarters to do ministry out of. And so we're not just looking to purchase a place so that we can do ministry in something. We're trying to purchase a place so we can do ministry out of something. And so a building can be a tool to do that. And so that's kind of where we're at. That's kind of our stance on, on why we're even pursuing this. It's because we believe it'll help us bring restoration through the gospel to Cincinnati and the world more effectively. Now, the reason that we haven't made an offer yet is because we're pursuing different means of financing. The good thing is, after speaking to the North American Mission Board, they have raised the amount of the loan that they said that they would give us. So that's a really good thing. So now if you take what our financial stewardship team said that they felt comfortable with putting toward that from our savings, as well as our loan, we are a little over 80% to the goal of what we think we would need to be able to make a legitimate offer on this building. That also means that there's a little bit of a gap. And so the question becomes, how can we bridge that gap? How can we close that gap as a church family? Uh, as we've talked about it, prayed about it with our elders, we believe that is through something we're going to call the Roots Initiative. And so I kind of wanted to give you a heads up that next week we're going to be talking about something called the Roots Initiative, where we're going to say, hey, let's see if we can close this gap. Um, let's see if this is what God has in store for us. And um, even if somehow by God's hands, uh, this building becomes no longer available in the next couple months, we're, we are open-minded about that. We believe that either way, we want to prepare for this thing that we feel like would help us um, do ministry better in our city. And so we're going to be talking about the Roots Initiative um, in the weeks and months to come. And honestly, we're excited to see what God does. So we realize this is a huge undertaking. Um, while maybe the loan amount isn't as big as what we wanted it to be, we also realize that taking out a smaller loan from an entity means really small payments. Um, so it's, it's not going to be this huge jump in our budget, as you might would expect if we were to take out a huge loan. It just means there's going to be a little bit more work on the front end, and we're excited to see what God does with that and walk through that together as a church family. Um, so hopefully you guys have all found Colossians chapter 1. Uh, you're there, and you're all curious about what we're going to talk about next week, but I want you right here with me this morning, this afternoon, uh, for the rest of our time. Maybe some of you uh, remember what it's like to create a resume. A part of applying for loans with different banks and all this kind of stuff is I had to make a resume because for some reason they wanted to see what I had done or something like that before they would even think about loaning our church any money. And I haven't made a resume in a really long time. And so it's kind of funny to look back at old resumes. But if you've made one, you know that you kind of put this stuff on there that you're hoping that whenever you get an interview, somebody will talk to you about. And regardless of what kind of job you are applying for, you know that there are kind of always two questions that you're going to be asked in the interview. They are, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? And it's always a really awkward question to answer because whenever they say, hey, what are your strengths? You're trying to think about the things that you can mention that make you seem very hireable and yet not proud or arrogant. And so there's kind of this awkward thing where you're like, well, you know, I don't really want to say, but here are the five things that I know I'm really good at that are going to make you want to hire me. And, and just as awkward is whenever the question comes, what are your weaknesses? And nobody really likes to talk about their weaknesses. And so in the job interview, you give weaknesses that make you seem like you're being honest, which you are, 
and vulnerable, but some of them, you know, you wouldn't really share any weaknesses that would make you get passed over for the job, so your weaknesses become, you know, I just care too much about my work, or I'm a perfectionist, right? You give these weaknesses that they're kind of like, okay, sure, like that is, that is a weakness that you would also put in the strength category, I'm sure. Well, why don't we like to talk about our weaknesses in those interviews with people? Why do we hide our weaknesses or our insufficiencies? It's because we hate to embrace our own insufficiency. We hate to embrace insufficiency in our relationships. We hate to embrace our insufficiency in our jobs. We hate to embrace our insufficiency in our spiritual life. And the reality is, regardless of what we may try to hide whenever it comes to our own weakness, God knows it all. Life often reveals our insufficiency. Whenever you're going through a difficult time, you feel anxious, you feel burdened, what you realize in that moment is, I am insufficient to sustain my joy in the midst of trial. Whenever you seek to love other people as Christ has loved us, you realize, I'm very insufficient to do this in my own strength, and I'm a lot more selfish than I realize. Whenever you try to just kind of be this person who is morally pure and strong and rejecting sin at every turn in your own strength, what you realize is, I'm completely insufficient within myself to actually do this. And so what Colossians chapter 1 and and the beginning of Colossians 2 is going to do for us is it's going to invite us to recognize our own insufficiency, but then turn our eyes to the sufficiency of of Christ. Last week we talked about the supremacy and the centrality of Christ, and this week we're going to keep walking with Paul, and he's going to show us the sufficiency of Christ. Christ is sufficient for joy in the midst of trial and hardship. Christ is sufficient to sustain you in serving other people and in serving the Lord, even whenever it's difficult, and even when those people don't reciprocate the same kind of behavior. Christ is sufficient to enable you to mature in your faith, even whenever you feel exhausted and worn out, to keep taking steps nearer to God because it is only His power that can sustain you. I I want to point to the insufficiency of ourselves and the sufficiency of Jesus for for two reasons. Because if we don't focus on the sufficiency of Jesus whenever we feel insufficient in ourselves, we will become anxious, anxious, We'll become burdened, we'll become depressed, we will think there is absolutely no hope at all. But whenever we see the sufficiency of Jesus in light of our weakness, it will point us to him. I mean, so many of us have felt insufficient, and it's led us to pay a steep price to fill that void through toxic relationships, through addiction, through self-loathing, whatever it is, whenever we feel insufficient, we run to other things. Some of us feel our insufficiency, and and we just try to replace it with a false sense of confidence. We say, no, I am sufficient. We become proud. And and maybe you'd say, you know what, that's not me. I've never been in that position. But I think it often kind of conceals itself. Whenever we think that we are sufficient within ourselves, we, we become calloused because we don't want to seem weak to other people. We isolate ourselves and withdraw from community because we don't need anybody keeping us accountable. We don't need other people. Whenever we become sufficient in ourselves, we try to fake this by just not going to God in prayer. We think, I've got this on my own. We build our own little kingdom to give us a false sense of security. And so many of us have hopped onto the treadmill of our own self-sufficiency to realize you can run as hard as you want and get nowhere at all. It is only in beholding Christ that we will truly see the sufficiency of Jesus for all of life. And so whether you see this for the very first time this afternoon, or whether you realize this afresh, I want to point you to the sufficiency of Jesus, and that is our main point this afternoon, that Jesus is completely sufficient for your ministry, how you serve brothers and sisters in Christ, for your mission, how you serve those who don't yet know Christ, and for your spiritual maturity, for your progress in the faith. Christ is completely sufficient for all of life. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to read verses 24 through chapter 2, verse 5. Follow along with me. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh, 
I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Let me remind you what's going on here in this situation. Paul is writing to this church that's just a couple years old. It was planted by a guy named Epaphras who was discipled or taught by Paul. And so he went back to his hometown. He planted this church. Some false teachers came in and said, hey, that Paul guy, he says that Jesus is enough to have a relationship with God, but he's in a Roman prison right now. So can you really trust him? These are actually all the things that you need to do to be made right with God. You should listen to us and not him. Well, Epaphras went and told Paul, hey, these are all the things that people are saying. And so Paul sends this letter to the church in Colossae to tell them, hey, this is what the true gospel is, the sufficiency of Jesus. And so the first thing that I want you to see in this passage is that Jesus is sufficient for your joy in suffering. Jesus is sufficient for your joy in suffering and in serving him. Now look at verse 24. Paul says, now I rejoice in my suffering. And you're thinking, okay, how can you have joy in suffering? I don't know about you, but that's probably not your normal response to suffering. I'm rejoicing in this. Well, this is important because some of the people that were teaching these false things said, if you want to truly have a relationship with God, If you want to please him, then what you need to do is punish yourself. Uh, You need to kind of make yourself suffer, and in that, God will be pleased. Well, what Paul will say again and again is, hey, Jesus suffered in your place. You are fully accepted in the suffering of Jesus, and because he suffered and because you are now fully accepted, you can suffer with joy so that other people may know Christ. Because he doesn't just say, well, I'm just rejoicing in my suffering for the sake of suffering. No, he says, I am suffering for your sake. He is suffering that other people may know Christ, not so that he would be accepted before God. He's taking something that was taught by these false teachers and then turning it on its head and say, no, there is a much greater reason to suffer. And it is with joy that other people may know Christ. As we continue in this passage, we read that Paul says, In my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. And you read that, and your theological smoke detector goes off, and you're like, hold up. Did Paul just say that there is something lacking in the afflictions of Christ? What does he mean whenever he says this? Well, last week we read that the blood of Jesus was completely sufficient for salvation. We read that he reconciles us to God through his sacrifice on the cross. So we see what Paul is not saying. He's not saying that something else needed to be done so that people could be saved. Whenever Jesus died on the cross, he says, it is finished. So what does Paul mean whenever he says that he's filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions in his body? Well, what we realize is that 
the news of Christ's affliction had not yet been heard by every person that existed. And so Paul is suffering so that other people would hear about Jesus, even though they never saw Jesus. And that way he's filling up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions. He's being treated like Jesus was to some degree so that the mission of Christ to the world would continue. Sam Storms, another pastor, says it like this. He says, what is lacking then in Christ's afflictions is not propitiation, but presentation. So in other words, the sufferings of Jesus fully satisfied the wrath of God, but there is lacking a personal presentation by Christ himself to the nations of the world. And in that way, Paul is making Christ known. And so he's being afflicted so that other people would know about the afflictions of Jesus. Now, there have been entire books written on the interpretation of that passage, and so that's like me trying to give you the microwaved version of something that is like mind-boggling, right? Uh, In verse 25, Paul says, of which I became a minister, he's talking about the joy that he has in serving Jesus. He became a minister according to the stewardship from God. God gave him this ministry that was given to him to make the word of God fully known. He sees this as something that God has given him. He he calls himself a steward. Well, what is a steward? In this time period, stewards was someone who would have been like a hired hand in a home, who would have had charge over the family's affairs, would have been able to manage their finances. And so they were responsible for the way that they took care of what was the master. And so what Paul is saying here is, and I've been given this beautiful message I've been given this mystery of the gospel that sinners could be reconciled to God. And so in my life and and whatever breath I have in my bones, I want to leverage that so that other people would know Jesus. And and although we would read this passage and see this is clearly about Paul, what I want to uphold for us as a church is that we have the joy of serving Jesus. We too have a ministry that has been given to us by God in that we have received this same message. Paul uses such personal language here because this is a very personal ministry that he has. And so you may hear this and you're thinking, well, you know, I don't know if I will be a full-time pastor. I don't know if I would be an international missionary. I think some of you will be. I think God is stirring some of your hearts right now to say, what would it look like for me to use my skills, my talents in an international context? What would it look like for you to move and serve with the church plant that we support in London for two years? Do you know that if you feel God calling you into this, that we could send you for two years fully funded to serve with an international church plant, that you could use whatever God has gifted you to do that? Maybe, maybe God is, is tugging at your heart to do that right now. Uh, our passion, our vision as a church is to not just be a church that grows by addition, but a church that grows by multiplication. We want to plant more churches. And I believe that if God has given our pastors the specific call and desire to plant more churches in our city and throughout the country, that God has also called some of you to say, you know what, I... I think I would really like to teach other people the Bible. I really think that I would love to help disciple other people. I think I would like to plant a church so that other people would grow to know Jesus. And maybe that's you. Maybe you'd say, you know what, I don't know if that's me. Well, what I want you to see is that this ministry of gospel proclamation is for every single Christian. That in the moment you were converted, you were also commissioned I want you to see the fact that if you are a part of the Oaks Church, you are a church planter. Have you ever thought about that? Every week whenever you show up here, you are a part of establishing a church that didn't exist three years ago so that people would know and hear the gospel. Every time you pray for another church member, every time you encourage a person that is in this room and you take them out to lunch or coffee whenever you use your home for hospitality to build other people up. You're a part of planting a church. When you serve, whenever you give, whenever you help other people grow, you're a part of establishing a church. You're doing gospel ministry. Even this week, um, there was just this huge blessing for our family in the way that um, I saw someone serve my wife. 
uh, Corey and Micaiah and Gabby, they would hate that I'm, I'm saying this, but they just dropped by the house this week with um, a gift and flowers for my wife to say, hey, we see the way that, that you're raising your kids and you're serving your family and you're serving the church, and we just want to encourage you. See, even if you're not on a Sunday serve team, you can still minister to others in the body. And so we have received a ministry. Let us serve Christ with joy. What Paul says here is that his desire in ministry is to make the word of God fully known. Well, what is the word of God? He calls it a ministry. Look at verse 26. He says, it is a mystery hidden for ages and generations, but has now been revealed to the saints. Well, one of the things that all of these false teachers constantly said in Colossae is that they had a mystery that no one else knew about. So they would say, well, we have this secret mystery that if you trust in Jesus and then observe the Old Testament food laws, then you'll really be on God's good side. Well, if you trust in Jesus and then you make sure that you go to the right ceremonies, then God will really make your family healthy. If you just you know, trust in Jesus, but then have this experience, like this mystical experience with an angel, then that's how you know that God really loves you. They had all of these weird secrets. It was this spiritual elitism. It was very strange that these false teachers were bringing this stuff in. Well, then, you know, they're saying, what does Paul know? He's in prison. And what Paul says is, I know the mystery that has actually been revealed because it's no longer a mystery. What is it? In verse 27, he says to them, being the saints, being the church, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Well, what is it? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Three times he will use this word mystery to say the mystery has been revealed. The mystery is Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, Uh, There were these promises of a Messiah that would come. There were these promises of God. And in the Old Testament, for someone to have a relationship with God, they simply believed in his promises. Well, in the New Testament, Christ comes, and the mystery is revealed. Now, we have a relationship not by trusting God's promises, but by trusting in the person of Christ by faith. And so what Paul is saying here is that there is no longer a mystery, but that it has been revealed. I mean, think about the Old Testament, whenever Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And what did God tell Eve? There will be one that will come from your line. And although he will crush the serpent's head, his heel will be bruised, but he will be victorious. Think about the promise that was made to Abraham in Genesis 12. Through your line, all families of the earth will be blessed. Think about the promise that was made to King David. There will be one who comes from you, and he will have a throne that never ends. He will be a king who rules in righteousness. And so there was kind of this mystery here. And then Christ comes, and the mystery has been revealed. Who is it that crushes the serpent's head? Is it not Christ on the cross who crushes Satan? Who is it that blesses all the families of the earth? Is it not Christ who offers salvation to anyone who believes? Who is it that reigns on a throne in righteousness? Is it not the resurrected Christ reigning in heaven for all eternity? The mystery has been revealed. And so here Paul is saying the mystery has been made known to the Gentiles that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And now every time they think about this mystery, they know who the answer is. As I was thinking about this this week, I was reminded of whenever I was in high school. And uh, I was just terrible at math, still am terrible at math, but uh, trigonometry was definitely like the worst for me. So I got some head nods out there, um, fellow sufferers. So I, I got a D in trig. It was, it was pretty bad. Well, the teacher felt really sorry for me, so I don't know if it was me or her, but either way, we just we couldn't we couldn't make it work, and so uh, I just kept failing tests. Well, she said, "You know what? Come in during your lunch break every every two days or so, and I'll tutor you." So there I was. Miss Miller was tutoring me. You know, all my friends are like walking by the class, eating lunch, and I'm just like hanging out in there doing trig problems. Well, what I realized uh, after a couple weeks is it was time to take a test. 
She put the test down in front of me, and I look at the first problem, and I say, man, that looks really familiar. And what I realized is that the first question on the test was a practice question that she had given me just a couple days before. And so then I was like, well, that's, man, that is very convenient uh, for someone who does not know trig. And so, so then I look at the next problem, and then I, I flip through the next two pages, and I'm like, the study guide that she has been using for the past two weeks is exactly line for line, number for number, the test that sits in front of me. And I was thinking, this isn't fair. So I raised my hand and said, Miss Miller, I'm just kidding, I did not do that. I said, this is amazing, right? Maybe my conscience wasn't what it is now. Who knows? Anyways, I made a very good grade on that trig test. Uh, really impressed everybody. Um, of course, she wasn't surprised. What happened? Well, well the, what had formerly been a mystery to me was now completely revealed. Now, whenever we read the Old Testament, what, what was once shrouded in mystery is now revealed by Jesus. Jesus is the answer key for every single promise that was ever made. You're reading through the Old Testament, and you see, well, who is it wrestling with Jacob? Is it not Jesus? Who is that fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Who is it in Isaiah's vision that is sitting on the throne? It is Jesus. It is Jesus. The sufficiency of Jesus throughout every single page of Scripture, pointing his kings, prophets, and people to him, that we would behold his glory. And we need to hear this because right now there are things going on in every single one of our lives where we are begging the question, is Jesus enough for this? Is Jesus enough that I could walk through this? Is Jesus enough for me to be able to handle this? As you think about what's coming up in the next week or month, is Jesus enough? And I think if you were to be sitting next to Paul in his Roman imprisonment, he would look over at you, put his cuffed hand on your shoulder and say, he is. I've been there. I know it. He is. Jesus is enough. He is sufficient for your ministry, for your mission, and for your maturity in the faith that you would cling to him. He shows us here that the gospel is good news for all people. He says to the Jew and to the Gentile. That means no matter what kind of baggage you have, no matter if you grew up in a religious home or not, no matter what you're bringing into this room, that the gospel is good news for you, that it is not something that you work for, but simply believe that Christ is enough and you'll be saved. He also shows us that the gospel is not simply about God being with you, but it is the hope that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Is that not what Paul says here in verse 28? This great mystery is that Christ is in you. Throughout the pages of Scripture, it was promised again and again, the presence of God will be with you. The presence of God will be with you. And then Jesus comes, and we see that this glorious truth is that it is Christ in you. Theologians call this union with Christ. That's what it means to abide in Christ, that we are both in Christ and that Christ is in us. In Ephesians 5, Paul talks about this mystery, and he says it's a lot like uh, being married. So whenever Abby and I got married, the two became one flesh. We became united. Our lives became joined. So all of our debts and everything that we had in our bank accounts was, was joined. It became one. Well, whenever we are united with Christ, whenever we are in Christ and Christ is in us, whenever we become one with him in that moment that we believe, all of our spiritual debt and unrighteousness is credited to his account. And his immeasurable, his immeasurable riches of obedience and perfection is accredited to us. Every single debt that we once needed to pay and every sin that we were shackled to is now removed and we are made whole in Christ. Additionally, our union with Christ is not just a past moment, but it is a moment-by-moment -moment reality. So Abby and I weren't just married. We are married. It is a moment-by-moment -moment reality that we are joined to Christ. And Paul in Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What does Paul say? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
His ability to obey, his ability to suffer, his ability to share the gospel, all came from the work of Christ in him because he was united to Christ. Uh, the concept of being united with Christ, or Christ in us, the hope of glory, I feel like uh, is explained well by an author named Rankin Wilburn. He wrote this book called Union with Christ, and it's really good, uh, but in it he uses an extremely nerdy example. Okay, So that's my preface, extremely nerdy example. Um, but I didn't make it up, so don't judge me. But it's helpful. He says, our, our union to Christ in the life of a Christian is similar to being a superhero. But, like I said, nerdy example, but as being a superhero, we are more like Spider-Man than we are like Batman. Okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, so, so Batman's strength his abilities came from outside of himself, right? He was able to uh, get gadgets to put in his tool belt. He was able to train, to, to learn new skills. He was able to work really hard that kind of made him become something that he wasn't. He was able to add all this stuff to him to make him something that he was not that made him super. Spider-Man, on the other hand, was, was not super just because he added a lot of stuff to him, but something affected him that changed him on a molecular level. His very DNA was changed so that something took place internally, which eventually led to him being able to climb walls, to shoot webs out of his hands, and to have superhuman strength. Because something occurred on an internal, molecular level, everything else was changed about him. And what Paul is saying here is that Christ in us changes us from the inside out. It changes us on a molecular level so that the union of Christ in us through faith in him, changes everything about us. Now, how does this actually make sense in your life? It means that it's not just about trying harder. It's not just about doing uh, all these things that you can to change your habits or correct your behavior. It's about seeing who Christ is, about being changed from the inside out. Uh, because your DNA has changed, because you are a new creation, you long to spend time in God's word. Uh, you desire to spend time in prayer. And that you, you ask the Lord to continually change you in, in your spiritual DNA that you would long for the right thing and not just be this person that's constantly trying to perform for God. Not only that, I want you to see that Jesus is sufficient for your spiritual purity. Let's close this out. Paul says in verse 28, Him we proclaim, Jesus we proclaim, warning everyone. So, so we should be those who warn other people. I was warned. A message of repentance. There's, there's sin that will destroy your life. We should warn people like a lighthouse that shines light on the rocks to show people that there is danger and destruction that comes with sin. We warn people. We teach people. We desire to grow people in their faith that they may know Christ. Why? As Paul says, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Well, how do we grow people in maturity? It's just like that passage that Sarah read before, whenever Paul was writing to his protege, Titus. He says that you've received this grace to train you in godliness. You have received grace that you would grow in holiness, that you would grow in becoming who you are. We saw last week that we've been presented before God in Christ as holy, blameless, and above reproach. So what I want you to see is that your maturity is not about adding something to yourself that you don't currently have. Growing in spiritual maturity is about working out what God has already declared to be true about you. Let's put it this way. So I have an eight-month-old at home. Um, I find a way to talk about him every single week, if you haven't picked that up yet. So, so Charlie uh, is, is just this little guy. He doesn't know how to walk yet. He doesn't know how to talk yet. But he has everything that he needs to be able to do that. So he can't talk, but he has a mouth. He has a tongue. He has lips. Growing in maturity for him will simply be learning how to make syllables, learning how to make sounds that, that leads him to communicate. He's not gaining something that he doesn't already have. He's just learning how to use what he already has. 
You see, he's going to learn to walk as he matures, but right now he has two feet, he has legs, he has knees, he has ten toes, all the things they check at the doctor. He's going to learn to walk, not because we're going to give him something that he doesn't currently have, but because he's going to mature in learning how to apply what he's already been given. Well, for you to change the way that you talk, for you to change the way that you treat other people, for you to uh, change the way that you deal with sin in your life, is not about you adding something to yourself that you don't currently have. It is about maturing to the point that you learn how to apply what God has already given you. His grace, His sufficiency, His holiness. You are blameless in Christ. Growing in Christian maturity is simply about applying what you have already been given. And we have everything that we need in Christ himself. Paul continues in chapter 2 to say, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. What What is one of the marks of maturity here? That Christians love one another. I've never been a part of a church like the Oaks where people love one another so much. And at the same time, I think we need to be warned at just how much opportunity there is for disunity right now, not just within our church, but as we think about uh, things like um, political division and who we're voting for on November 3rd, what your stance is on masks, how you feel about church loans, like whatever it is, there's plenty of opportunity for disunity in this moment. And what I want us to do is remind ourselves that because Christ died, we are knit together in love. Not only that, maturity reaches all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, that we would be assured in Christ. I want you, as as someone who for a lot of my life has I was wondering, do I really have a relationship with God? I used to really struggle with that whenever I was younger. To, to know that if you are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for you. And maybe you're thinking, well, what if my grip to God is not strong enough? Hear these words from Jesus and be comforted. He says, I give them, I give you eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If you have trusted in Christ, then have assurance that you know him and no one can rip him, rip you out of his hands. Paul says that he wants them to have this full assurance so that they don't get swept away by plausible arguments. Next week, we're going to look at a lot of plausible modern arguments in our culture that could possibly sweep us away, and I'm really excited about that. But Paul here is going to close this section of the letter by saying that he rejoices. He's, he's ending the same way he picked up. He's rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. How would you describe your faith in Christ? Is it firm? How would you describe your faith? Is it in Christ? Is he your only hope saying, you know what, I know that I am made right with God because Jesus died on my behalf and because he rose to give me life and because I have fully trusted in him. You you see, we began this afternoon by talking about our resume. What would it look like one day if if we had this interview with someone and our strengths and weaknesses were exposed? But what I want us to know is that one day, every single one of us will have a spiritual interview before God Almighty. One day, regardless of what we say, our, our strengths will appear weak before God, and all of our weaknesses will be exposed. And on that day, only one thing on our spiritual resume will matter, and that is, is Christ a reference for you? Is it Christ's signature that is on your life? Are you able to say, here are my strengths, and yet they are still weak, and here are my weaknesses, and yet I am made strong because I have trusted in Christ? I pray that you would trust in Christ. I pray that you would be reminded of the goodness and sufficiency of Christ for all of life. Let us be those who admit our weaknesses because whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And it is in our weakness that his power is seen as sufficient. So Jesus is sufficient for your joy in serving him and serving others. 
Jesus is sufficient to fully reveal the mystery of the gospel, that it may no longer be a mystery to you. Would you trust in him? Jesus is sufficient for your spiritual maturity. Maybe for you, that means, okay, I'm turning away from this and turning to Christ this afternoon. For you, that may be, you know what, I need to make my faith public. I've personally confessed that Jesus is sufficient and never made it public, and you want to do that through baptism. Maybe for you, it is saying, you know what, I I need to be held accountable. One of the ways that I've been trying to be self-sufficient is by avoiding groups where I'm where I'm known by other people and know other people. We would love to get you connected in a missional community. For you, it may be, you know what, I really need people to walk with. And so maybe for you, it looks like joining this church or another like-minded church where you, where you will be spurned on week in and week out to see that Jesus is sufficient for all of life. So as we look at this passage, as we reflect on this truth, we believe that regardless of anything else, Jesus is sufficient and Jesus is enough. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we're thankful for your grace that not only saves us, but also grows us. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us just the specific ways that we need to mature as we reflect on this. Lord, would you reveal the the areas in our life that perhaps we feel insufficient and yet don't run to you? Lord, would you reveal the areas in our life in which we try to be self-sufficient, that you could rip that out of our hands? Lord, I pray for those who maybe in this room, and, and they've been trying for a long time. Maybe they feel like they're on a, a treadmill of performance just trying to fix their things up, and, and right now they just need to say, you know what, I'm going to trust that Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is sufficient for my failure. Jesus is sufficient for my joy. Jesus is sufficient for my life. Lord, if that's where they are, would they come and talk to me or one of our other pastors or the friend they came with? It would help us to be faithful to respond in this time to the fact that you are all we need. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
fighting for us, always fighting for us. Oh, when they go back down, facing armies of thousands, who speak one word and they scatter around us. You're fighting for us, always fighting. We just have a couple announcements before we conclude our services today. First of all, if you are a member, next Sunday we're having an extremely short, emphasis on the extremely short, members meeting directly after the service next Sunday. So literally just stick around for 10 to 15 minutes. We just have to get our budget out for next year that we'll be voting on in November. So we'll pass that out and have that members meeting next Sunday directly after the service. And uh, that will be something you don't want to miss. Um, and then next, we are also uh, gearing up for men's retreat coming up here in the next few weeks. It's sneaking up on us. Um, I looked this morning and we have seven spots left on that trip. So if you've been planning to go and you haven't signed up, you better sign up because uh, probably at some point this week that trip will fill up. So seven spots left. Make sure uh, that you go. You can find the sign up uh, through the weekly or you can come and talk to me and I'd love to tell you more about that. We're going to conclude our services by hearing the Great Commission found in Matthew 28. God's word says this. This is such a good parting word for us this morning and a good parting word for us any week uh, as we think about living our lives on mission here in the city. God's word says this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. And this is the good part. You ready? And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christ is with us always to the end of the age. And with that in mind, with that confidence, I pray that you would go forth this week and make disciples and live your life on mission. Oaks Church, you are sent.